Hi guys, welcome back. It's time for another lesson. Today we're going to study uh, the idea of root finding, and we're going to use as a context in order to apply that concept the notion of finding energy eigenstates of uh, quantum mechanical wave functions. So uh, hold on to your seats and let's see how this works. First, the idea is I've got some function, and the question is where is that function equal to zero? In this particular example, there are two zeros in the in the function, just in the uh, domain that's plotted there. <clears throat> let's, uh, and you can identify what they are there where the function goes through zero. Now let's, uh, let's zoom in a little bit and focus on the zero on the right there. And let's think about how we can write an algorithm to find that zero. The notion is if we start at a point that's not too far away, uh, we can evaluate the function at that point. So let's say we evaluate it right here and we call that point x old, the old value of x that is an estimate of where the zero is. And then we get a func we evaluate the function there and we get a value of y, which is the function result evaluated at the old value of x. And then here's the trick. This is called Newton's method. This is one way to find zeros. And the notion is you find the slope of the function at that point. You take the derivative of the function at that point. That's the rate at which the function is changing. And you use that to extrapolate backwards to see where the function would have gone through zero had the slope remained constant over that interval. And the idea is that if the slope isn't changing too quickly, it's a much improved guess as to where the function goes through zero. So you extrapolate to this new value of x, and then the idea is you repeat that process iteratively so that you reevaluate the function, you reevaluate the slope, you re-extrapolate, and you keep doing that. And if, uh, <clears throat> if the function is reasonably well behaved in the neighborhood of the zero and you're not too far away from the zero, then this uh, approach is extremely efficient. Let's, let's see a little bit more mathematically how that might work. We evaluate the derivative at the point <coughs> x old. That's uh, the rise over the run, basically, delta y over delta x. But the notion is that uh, you can solve that for delta x. But the delta x we're interested in is the delta x that gives us a y of 0. So that means the delta y we're interested in is the whole value of y, because we're trying to extrapolate clear back to 0. So you take the value of y at the point where you know the old x, you divide it by the slope, and that's the change in x, you need to subtract from the old x to get the new x. So the idea is you take the old x, subtract off the delta x you just calculated, and that gives you the new x. And you just repeat that over and over again. So let's, uh, let's do a demo and see how that works. Okay, so here's the IPython notebook that I posted to the class website. And uh, it's about root finding. And basically I wanted to show you how we can use Newton's method um, I did put a link in here uh, that I wanted to point out is to a, a YouTube video I put up uh, a long time ago about a particular problem in quantum mechanics called... I combine the, uh, lessons 19 and 20 together. Let's see. It's, uh, it's called the finite square well, and the important point about it, you can look at it if you're interested, the important point is you wind up with a transcendental equation uh, that looks something like this. If, and that's a pretty nasty looking transcendental equation, but you can recast it into a different one that's easier. And uh, I describe all this in the, in the podcast, but it has solutions. It's basically cosine of z is equal to z over z naught and sine of z is equal to z over z naught. And the roots of those equations turn out to be related to the eigenstate energies of the wave functions for the finite square well. And since the project for this week is also about finding eigen energies for different potentials, I thought this would be a good example. You could uh, listen to the podcast and hear what the what the plan is and how it works. Um, so that's just just an example that you can use if you're interested. So, um, but anyway, the point is you end up with this transcendental equation: sine z is equal to z over z naught, or cosine z is equal to z over z naught. Z naught is just a real number. And z is a number that's less than z naught that satisfies this transcendental equation. Um, <clears throat> really, z turns out to be related to the depth of the well and the mass of the particle and the width of the well and stuff like that. Um, but you can 
basically wash all that away and compute this single real number called z0 that depends on all that stuff. And the z values that satisfy this equation give you the energies of the eigenstates. So that's, uh, that's really all you need to know about that. <clears throat> now, let's, uh, let's look at what this function actually looks like. I, it, it turns out the cosine version always has a solution. Um, so no matter what z0 is, we can get a solution out of that one. So let's, let's focus on that one to begin with, just to see how this thing works. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start by just visualizing what's going on. I'm going to make z a, uh, a variable that goes from one to, or 0 to 1 and a half in 100 steps. And I'm, just to start somewhere, I'm going to define z0 as 2. And then the left side of this equation is the cosine of z. The right side is z over z0. And the function whose zeros we want to find is just the left side minus the right side, because if, uh, if the left side minus the right side has a zero, that means the left side is equal to the right side, and so that's a solution to the problem. So that's the idea. Let's just go ahead and take a look at that, and you'll notice that uh, the solution is when the z over z naught <coughs> is equal to the cosine of z. And that happens right about here. You can see it's a little bit bigger than 1, Here's one. Here's 1.2, so it's between 1 and 1.1, clearly, maybe 1.05. It's kind of hard to tell. Here is the left side minus the right side, <coughs> and you can see that it goes through 0. Here's 0. It goes through 0 at the same value of z where the left side and the right side are equal, which only makes sense. Now, to, in order to do the Newton's method uh, for root finding, we need also the derivative of the function whose zeros we're trying to find because uh, you need that to extrapolate. So I went ahead and cooked up a Python function, fp, which stands for f prime, which is just the derivative. The derivative of cosine is minus sine. The derivative of um, z over z naught is uh, 1 over z naught. But of course, the function whose derivative we're taking is the difference between the left and the right. So we're subtracting z over z naught, so I get a minus 1 over z naught as the derivative of that term. And so this is the derivative of the function whose zeros we're trying to find. And here goes Newton's method. This is a very simple implementation. I'm sure that it's not nearly as careful as you'd need to be if you were going to do this for, for a, a package of some kind that needed to handle all kinds of crazy situations. But I'm just using it for a couple simple examples. So I'm going to make it as simple to understand as possible, and not necessarily as robust as possible. So you have a function. You have the function's first derivative. You have the initial guess at the z value. Here I put in an epsilon of 10 to the negative 15. That just means that uh, if, if I get within 10 to the negative 15 of 0, I'm going to be happy. I, I'm going to put in 100 as the maximum number of iterations I'm willing to do. If I, if I haven't found a solution after 100 iterations, then I give up. And then uh, show count is just a Boolean, which tells whether or not it should dump out, if it should print out the results when it's done, or if it should just return the results. So uh, that's the idea. Actually, uh, I even realized there's an error here, which I will fix. There we go. And uh, so let's, let's go ahead and run the whole thing. I'll run this cell. <coughs> and then I'll run this cell. And that uh, should put a graph up. There's the graph, same graph we had before. I'm going to go ahead and run this cell. And then you can see it does indeed find the root. It's about 1.03. It only took three iterations, and it got y to be, to machine precision at least, to be equal to 0. Now there is a, um, oh, notice I didn't tell you the algorithm here. First you start out z at zi. You define y to be f evaluated at z. This could actually be a z here. So you could actually make that f evaluated at z. And I start the count at 0. <clears throat> then what I do is calculate the change in z, which is y divided by the derivative. I change z by the amount computed. I reevaluate y at the new z, and I increment the count. And I keep doing that until the absolute value of y is uh, equal to or less than epsilon, which is 10 to the negative 15. And count is no greater than n max. So if count ever gets equal to n max, I drop out. And I just keep doing that. And uh, you can see what happens if count is greater than n max. Then uh, I say I can't find a 0. Actually, it should be greater than or equal to n max. 
see, I told you I wasn't being very careful here. And then otherwise, uh, if show count is true, I print out what I found. Otherwise, I simply silently return Z. So that's the way the thing works. We'll run it again. It should, I haven't actually changed anything, so it should still work. Um, I wanted to point out that if you don't feel like writing your own root finding uh, implementation, you can pull one in from SciPy. There's one called Brent Q, which is advertised to be the uh, the most general and robust root finder in the in the SciPy package. And uh, the way it works is you pass in the function. No need to calculate its derivative. You just have to pass in the function. Now the bad news is you have to give it a range of values of z or x or whatever the independent variable is that. Uh, are on either side of the root you're interested in, and there has to be a sign change between the function on one side and the function on the other. If uh, So you have to know a little bit about where the roots are. <clears throat> you have to know where the sign changes occur in order to apply this one. But we know it's between 0.9 and 1.1, so I call it with that those bounds, and lo and behold, it finds the same root that we found before. So that's how root finders work in general. Now, the problem we're going to solve this week is to find the bound state energies of wave functions in arbitrary potentials. And so the idea is we have this uh, famous Schrodinger's equation, which is an appropriate equation to use to find wave functions in any potential. I want to apply it to find bound states. And if I'm looking at bound states, it turns out in one dimension, at least, bound states are all real. You don't have to worry about the complex nature of um, the wave function. And it also turns out um, the wave functions have to satisfy the boundary conditions at the boundaries of the well. Now, the kinds of potentials we're going to be dealing with in this project are potentials that are infinite at a finite value of x and infinite at another finite value of x. So you can think of these as sort of infinite square wells on the outside and some arbitrary potential on the inside. So the idea is the wave function has to go to 0 at the uh, endpoints at 0 and at L, and it can be anything it wants to in between, it just has to be 0 at the ends. That's the idea. That's the simplest case I could think of. <clears throat> and if you solve this for psi double prime, you'll see it's a second order differential equation, and it depends on the shape of the potential, and it depends on the energy. And actually, that's not quite right. I see other another error here. This should have uh, psi of x in it. <clears throat> there you go. See, it's nice to talk through these things and get all the errors fixed. So that's that's uh, the Schrodinger equation applied to uh, a one-dimensional potential with the boundary condition that the thing be 0 when x equals 0, and it's got to be 0 when x equals L. Now, the problem is there's only a few definite values of E for which those that condition can be satisfied for a given potential. And our job is to find those values of E. Those are the eigenstate energies. And the functions that correspond to particular values of E are called the eigenstates. So that's the idea. The potential I want to start with is the simplest case. It's where the potential is 0 everywhere between x equals 0 and x equals L. And the potential is infinite, of course, outside of that range. So um, that's the infinite square well. Now what I want you guys to do for your project is to change this potential to something else, anything you like, um, and then look at the wave functions that you get and find the energies that um, satisfy the boundary conditions for those wave functions. I'll, uh, basically all we're going to do is to use the Runge-Kutta algorithm, the, the Runge-Kutta method we cooked up before. We're going to decouple. This is a second order equation, so we have two first order equations. The first order equations are uh, psi 0 prime is equal to d psi 0, or I'm sorry, psi prime is equal to d psi dx, and psi double prime is equal to this stuff. So, and oh, also I realize, I think, did I get that right? Hang on. Uh, yes, that's correct. So, um, that's right. So those are the two couple differential equations. So we're going to keep track. Our state is going to have psi and psi prime. We're going to start at the left with x equals 0, with psi equal to 0, and psi prime equal to 1. It turns out the value of psi prime doesn't matter because we're going to be 
uh, extrapolating over to the other side and demanding that it be zero. So it doesn't matter what you start Psi prime with at the beginning, you always have to end up with zero at the other end. So uh, this is arbitrary, it just can't be zero. So you have to have some slope at the beginning. If you have no slope at the beginning and no value at the beginning, the thing is just going to be zero everywhere, and that's not interesting. So this has to be anything that's not zero. I picked one. I'm also picking units. H bar, mass, and length are all equal to one, just to keep it simple. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to make dx equal to L over 20. So there's 20 steps of x between one end of the well and the other. Um, I'm going to begin the energy at 90% of the ground state energy. This is the known theoretical ground state energy of a, a particle in an infinite square well. And I'm just starting out deliberately below that. So I know I won't get a zero at this energy. And then uh, just as before we've done in the past, we'll start with an X list with the first t item in it and a Psi list with the first item in it. So we put in the initial values for X and Psi. And here's our Runge Kutta algorithm. Notice it's exactly like the Runge Kutta we had before, except now there's this extra parameter E that's getting passed around. And that's just so that the derives function can know what the energy is. It needs to know that because Psi double prime <clears throat> is 2m over h bar squared times v of x minus e times psi. And e is the parameter that we're varying to try to get the thing to be 0 at the other end of the well. So we start with uh, x equal to 0. We start with psi and psi prime um, set to their initial values. And then the way this thing works is we march across the well from 0 to L. And we uh, calculate rk4 step each time getting the new value of the state. At each point we grab the value of x and we grab the value of psi because psi remember is the zeroth component of the state vector. We increment x and we keep going until x is equal to l at which point we're done. So um, then we graph the wave function and you'll notice since I picked an energy that was less than the known analytical solution the thing doesn't quite curve around enough to get back to zero. So that means our energy is too low, which makes sense because the higher the energy, the shorter the wavelength. So um, this guy hasn't quite made it back. So that means its wavelength is too long to fit in the well. If you try a slightly larger energy, let's see. Um, we, I can go ahead and show you that. Uh, if I if I start with a higher energy, so let's go back up here and make this 0 0.95, 0 0.95 the well width, and you'll see it gets closer. Um, now, since we know the solutions analytically to the infinite square well with the zero potential inside, then uh, we actually know the answer. And so I'm sort of cheating because I'm putting the energy deliberately not equal to the right value. But the, uh, the interesting point is that we can find the correct energy for any potential. So what I'm going to have you guys do is to modify the potential function, turn it into a potential that you're interested in, and then use the root finding to find the energies that make this thing work, that, that make the wave function work in your potential. And you're going to find that the, uh, well, you'll find the solutions to the uh, Schrodinger equation in your potential. So that's the idea. Now, uh, here is a slightly modified version. Notice I called it calc boundary condition. And basically what it does is it just calculates the value of psi at the far end of the well. It starts with psi equal to zero. And um, it starts with psi prime equal to one. And then it just goes across the well, but all it doesn't worry about saving the wave function. It doesn't worry about anything except calculating the value of psi at the other side of the well. The reason I did that is so we can use this in a root finding algorithm. We're trying to find the value of E <clears throat> that makes the wave function go to zero at, at x equals L. And so all I'm doing is treating that as a function. It's a function of E. And <clears throat> if, uh, if we find values of E for which this function is zero, then we've effectively found uh, the value of E that satisfies the Schrodinger equation and the boundary conditions. So if you evaluate calc BC at 4.4, then the wave function is above zero at the far end. If you go to 5.4, it's below zero. So you know the real eigenvalue has to be somewhere between 4.4 and 5.4. So I can use my Brent Q algorithm 
put in calc bc as the function, tell it to look between 4.4 and 5.4, and what does it find? 4.93, 4.93485, or whatever. <clears throat> if, I, uh, if I calculate the exact value of the energy for the ground state wave function of the infinite square well, we get 4.9348. Uh, it's a little different, and that's because, of course, our Runge-Kutta algorithm is only approximate. Um, if you want to improve the accuracy, you have to go back up here and uh, make dx smaller. The smaller dx is, the more accurate the thing will be. But I think that's enough. That's sufficient for our purposes. You know, what do we have here? Um, one, two, three, four, five. Four and a half or five digits, so uh, that's pretty darn good for the purposes we have in mind. Um, I also want to point out one other difference. With the runga Kutta algorithm we used before, we were integrating in time. So time was the variable, and dt was the differential, the, the step size. Now we're integrating in space from one side of the well to the other. So instead of having time here, I put x, and instead of having dt, I've got dx. So in case you're concerned about that, it's basically because we're integrating over space instead of over time. But, uh, you know, the differential equation doesn't really care. It just knows we're, we're trying to solve it. So that's the idea. So what are you going to do? Um, you're going to pick a different potential. You're going to modify this code that I provide you to compute the energy eigenvalues of the Schrodinger equation in that potential. I want you to produce graphs of the wave functions in a few different energy states that you, for which you find eigenvalues. And uh, I'd like you to try to find some way to validate your results. In other words, based on your potential, based on what you know about how the thing ought to go, see if you can't figure out some way to, to convince yourself that your results are correct. So that's the idea. We'll talk to you guys soon.